heard a story about an architect that was going and he was examining this place where this great cathedral was being built. And he was going around and he was seeing different work people, different tradesmen. They're working. He'd go up and he'd ask a guy, I said, what are you doing? And one guy said, I'm a hod carrier. Anybody know what a hod carrier is? Nobody ever worked a brick trade. It's the guy that carries the mortar for the brick mason. He said, I'm carrying hod. You know, I'm a hod carrier. I carry, basically he's saying, I carry the mortar for the guy that's laying the stone. Go to up to the other guy, what are you? Well, I'm a stone mason. I'm, I'm a fitting the stone. He went up to another craftsman. He said, well, I'm, I'm putting windows in. I, I do the windows. And uh, another guy, well, I'm sweeping up the dirt these other guys make. You know, I'm the cleanup crew. He only found one guy. When he asked this question, he said, I am building a great cathedral. What are we doing as a church? Now, in uh, some places, ch churches are made of stone. You know why we don't make stone churches here? No stone. We don't have stone. It's really tough to make stone churches without stone. But uh, what we are and what we are to be is not a stone church, a church made out of hard stone. We are actually building a living temple out of living stones. The church has gathered here today. We have come together. We've come together from Gentilly, from West Bank, by way of Gentilly. Uh, we've gathered from various places, and we are building a house where God is worshipped. We're going to be singing some more in just a little bit to enable us a little bit. That's preacher talk in about 40 minutes from now. We're going to let you uh, sing a little bit more, but we're going to praise the Lord because that's what we're here for. Look what he says in verse 4. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. What's a spiritual house? Well, that's a temple. That's a church. You're being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Well, let's ask the Lord to make that true of us and to help us to understand that today. Father, we come to your presence with your word and asking, Lord, that you'll work it in our heart and life. Father, we'll understand who we are and what we're doing. But most importantly, Lord, that we'll be able to praise you as you are. That's our purpose today. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will work that in us, that your Son, Jesus Christ, might be glorified. And, Father, that you might be pleased with what is done today in worship. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. We're growing up into salvation through the pure spiritual milk that is through the word of God. Remember in the previous verses, verses 1 through 3, talking about we're growing up into salvation. That pure spiritual, that pure food that we need. The word spiritual there doesn't mean spiritual. It means this is the, the kind of milk that a Christian ought to have. It's different from the word that's used later on about a spiritual house, spiritual folks. It's saying you need the word of God in order to grow as a Christian. You need the word of God to be saved. You've got to hear the God's message, the gospel message in order to be saved. And you need to continue to intake the word of God, to study the word of God, to read the word of God in order to grow. That's why you have the assignments, why you have the questions. So you can be doing that during the week. You're not just learning in this one hour on Sunday, but through the week you're feeding on the Word of God. You're thinking about the Word of God. You're taking in the Word of God because it will remind you of the thing that gives us focus in life, and that is that the Lord is good. Have you tasted that the Lord is good? That was not rhetorical. Have you tasted that the Lord, have you begun to experience that the Lord is good in your life? Well, when you understand that the Lord is good and you keep that focus on your life, then you don't worry about, as we were talking in Sunday school, what God gives other people. You're just so thrilled with what God has given you. And you recognize that God has been good to me. Has God been good to you? All right. God is good and God has been good to us. We've tasted that the Lord is good. Now, we're coming to the one, he says here in verse 4, who is rejected by humans. Annas, the high priest, the granddaddy high priest. 
the father-in-law high priest, and Caiaphas, his son-in-law. When they were building their Jewish religion, when they were building the way they were going to worship there and continuing on under their leadership, and by the way, that continued for about 40 years, they decided that Jesus Christ had no part of their life, no part of their religion. They rejected him as the cornerstone. That's what it means when it says here, you're coming to the, the living stone rejected by humans. As Christians, there are going to be times that you're going to be rejected by other human beings. That's why he's writing this book. These folks were being rejected by folks that they'd grown up with all their life. And now that you're not going to participate in the pagan temple worship, we don't want to have anything to do with you. He wants to remind them, you're the same kind of living stone that Jesus Christ, the experience he had of being rejected, you're beginning to experience that, that rejection from the world. We're coming to Jesus Christ, though, and saying he's rejected by man, but praise God, he is chosen and precious to the Father. He is chosen by God. God chose Jesus Christ before he began the world to be the one to save you whom he has chosen as well before the foundation of the world. God said, I don't care what Anna says. I don't care what Caiaphas says. Jesus Christ is my choice. I consider him precious. I consider him more valuable than anything else. In fact, he is so precious and so valuable. This is the one that I'm going to give to demonstrate my love to the world. This is the one I'm going to give in exchange for that other precious thing that I value. You know what that precious thing is? Child of God, do you know what that precious thing is? What did Jesus Christ give? Who did he give it for? He gave it for you. Think about that just a minute. God, before the world began, looked at you and said, that one. That one is so precious in my sight. That one I have chosen. That one I have put my love upon, and I'm going to give the most precious one that I have. My son, Jesus Christ, his life in exchange for yours. Because otherwise, you'll never get there. I love you, God says, but you're rotten to the core. Amen? That's true. Isn't it? Is it true of us? We're rotten to the core. But God says, I'm going to show you my love because I'm going to take this chosen, precious one, this living stone, and he's going to be the beginning of of all things. I'm going to build a spiritual house around him. And I'm going to take living stones like you. And I'm going to put you together. And you're going to become a temple where God is praised. A great cathedral where God is worshipped. A people of God. Now there's no shame in Jesus Christ. Look what he says here in verse 6. As you come to him the living stone. Rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Verse 6, for in the scriptures it says, he's going to quote here from Isaiah 28, See, I lay a stone in Zion, that is Jerusalem, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will probably not be put to shame. Is that what the scripture says? Shall not. Will never be put to shame. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, others may try to shame you, but you will never be shamed. Because you know who decides who gets shame and who gets honor? It's God the Father. God has made the decision. If your faith and trust is in my son Jesus Christ, you'll never, ever be put to shame. There's no shame in following Jesus. There's hardship. There's difficulties. There's people that will have bad opinions of you. There are folks that will torture you. There's folks that will kill you. There's folks that will do everything they possibly can to keep the gospel message from spreading. But there's absolutely no shame in suffering for Jesus Christ. Now there's shame in suffering as a thief, he'll go on to say. There's shame as, of suffering as a scoundrel. 
But there's no shame in suffering for Jesus Christ. If you are suffering, if people are putting you down, if people are looking fun at you, if you're losing friends because you've trusted Christ your Savior, relax. There's no shame in that. Why? Because you put your trust in the Son of God. The Bible tells us in the book of Colossians chapter 3 verse 1, you're already seated in heavenly places. You've already got a seat right there around the throne. You're secure. Don't worry about that. But like Jesus had to go through difficult times in this world, you also are going to have to go through difficult times. They chose to reject God. And God says, as he says in the book of Malachi, Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. When they rejected Jesus Christ, God said, from this point on, what you're doing and offering me worship is absolutely useless. He goes on to say, I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. Wow. Picture there is the picture of the wailing wall in Jerusalem. It really is a wall of shame. It is a reminder when they gather there to pray. That, see, the, the, the wailing wall is not really part of the temple. It's a retaining wall where Herod had expanded the temple mount so more people could wander around. It was in this area above the wailing wall that the merchants had set up their shameful practices of robbing people and stealing people. And where the, the nations ought to have been coming to praying, they were making it a place of mer merchandise and market. And God says, have no more of that. In the 70 AD, several years after 1 Peter was written, that temple mount was cleared. And all that's left is a rock, stone, retaining wall. And they gather there to pray, and it's a reminder. It's like God ought to, you know, they ought to see there on the wall what I've written there. What God has written. I'm not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty. Does this not tell it? You've rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, my Messiah, my choice as the cornerstone for all religion. You've rejected him, and he says, I will accept no offering from your hands. From now on, it's worthless. But, you know, we recognize that. That's why we came to God. We were doing worthless things. And the stuff that we were trying to do to impress God and to make God pleased with us and to say, well, we've worshipped God and we really felt like we've worshipped today and God says it's absolutely useless. The only thing I'll accept from you is faith in my son, Jesus Christ. When you put your trust in him, God says, I'm pleased with you. And if you don't put your trust in him, no matter what else you do, God says, I'll not accept it from your hand. It's not spiritual worship. It's not acceptable to me. That's what God's saying. But notice what he says in verse 5. As believers, you are like living stones. Not like those hard stones that God has rejected and had torn down. He says you. Now he's talking to us individually and as a group here together. You are a living stone. God is building you together together. To worship God. You are a living stone being built into a spiritual house. I'm here on Mondays. Come in here on Monday morning. Church not here. You say, what happened to it? Did it disappear? Are we living in time? No. I come in and this whole room's empty. That's when I come in and I nudge all the seats forward. You knew I was doing that, didn't you? So I knew you're doing something. Uh, nobody's here. The church isn't here. The church is out doing something else. But on Sunday morning, we're gathered again. All of a sudden, you know why we're here? Well, we're here because we've got difficulties in our life, right? We're here because we've got heart. We're here because we need something to do on Sunday morning because the football game's not on. No, what are we here for? We're here. God has gathered the church here to worship him to praise him, to spend our time thinking about how good the Lord is. We are a, building a spiritual house, and every believer that comes in becomes a part of this spiritual house, a part of what God is building as a worship of him. Well, a spiritual house, a temple requires a holy priesthood, a holy priesthood. 
You are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. You know what holy means? It means dedicated to one purpose alone. A sacred purpose. Child of God, do you recognize that you are a member of a holy priesthood? You are exclusive for God. You are exclusive for God. You are representing God and God alone to the world. And a world that is lost to God. That's what a priest does. God has called you together for the exclusive purpose of being his servants, his representatives in this world of gay, as Lawrence was talking about. Unlike the doomed temple with its man-made religion and rejected rituals, we are, he says, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What are spiritual sacrifices? Well, it's not money. Stop offering money. Preacher, did you say that? We've got a deacon's meeting Tuesday. I better clarify what I'm talking about. If you're trying to get to heaven by offering money, you're wasting your money. What does God want? Your money? No, God doesn't want your money. God wants everything you are. 100%. And he wants that offered to him as praise, as spiritual praise. When we sing praises to God, when out of our heart arises praises to God, that's the spiritual sacrifice God's looking for. When we treat our brother and sister right, that's the spiritual sacrifice that's acceptable to God because that's produced by the Spirit of God in us. That love for the brethren comes from the working of the Spirit of God within us. It is his work. And therefore, God is pleased with it. Now, in verses 7 and 8, he turns to answer an unspoken question. So I'm going to speak it. And here's the question. Why such a difference between the way we believers see Jesus and his rejection by unbelievers like Caiaphas? I want you to understand, Caiaphas knew more scripture than I knew. He could quote it in Hebrew. There's very little Hebrew I can quote. And even less that I can quote correctly. But he could quote. He knew a lot of scripture, but he missed Christ. Why? Why did they reject? And why do we accept? Well, he goes on to tell us about that. Verse 7. Now, do you believe this who believe this stone is precious? But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. He is precious to us. Rejected by the world. We value Christ as the cornerstone of our life. As the one around whom we're going to build everything in our life. And they say Christ is absolutely worthless to me. They may not come out and say that. But they come out and say it because they don't follow Christ. They don't try to become Christian. They don't try to live like Christ. They are rejecting Christ. But some of them will just come right out and say don't want anything to do with Christ. He's not going to be the cornerstone of my life. Now, there's two ideas on this cornerstone. Uh, in the old way of thinking, stonemason way of thinking, a cornerstone is where you start the building. If you want to build a building, you've got to start with a square corner. Let me put it back. If you want to build a square building, if you want to build something right, you start with one corner. This is my square from which I'm going to start and measure in every direction. You square up that corner by, remember, three, four, five. You remember three on one side and four on the other side, and you make the other match to five, you've got a square corner. They square it up, but they would square it up with a stone. They would square this stone and say, now this square stone is the cornerstone. From this point, we're going to measure everything out from this one square corner. That's Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. But there's also an idea that it may have to refer to the capstone of an arch. When you come to the arch, you'd have the chief stone because it literally says the head of stone, the chief stone. Well, the chief stone that holds the whole arch together is Jesus Christ. Well, either way you're looking at it, what is central is Jesus Christ. If you're gonna be built into a living arch, you've gotta have Christ as the capstone. But probably I think it is that if you're going to build a square temple, if you're going to build a place that's right for God to worship in, a place that's righteous, you've got to start with Jesus Christ and build as he is the chief cornerstone and building together. So we're doing that. He's the cornerstone. Now listen, even if they reject him, 
You know what he is? He's still the cornerstone. It hasn't changed a bit. He's just the cornerstone there not found. Now listen to me, child of God. Those of you who are not saved that are here today and listening to me, understand that if you're not building your life around Jesus Christ, your built life is askew. You're not fitting into the purpose for which God has you upon this earth. God is calling you. God is calling you right now in this very instance to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ who loved you enough to die in your place so that all the obstacles between you and God could be removed in one fell swoop there on the cross. How do you know that God did that? How do you know God accepted what Christ did? Well, he raised him from the dead. Only God could have done that. And by doing that, God said, this is the one by whom I'm going to build the lives. This is the one by whom I'm going to build my church. And he invites you to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and let him do his marvelous work of salvation so that you also become with us a living stone built on the cornerstone. But if you will not trust Christ, I guarantee you he will become a stumbling stone. He says, and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Verse 8. The same stone around which we're building our church, building our lives, has become an insurmountable barrier to religion for many people. They just cannot love Christ. They love religion, but they don't love Christ. They don't love the Christ of the Bible, the Christ as he has revealed himself. They might accept a meek and lowly Jesus who never harmed a soul, but they could not tolerate a bully who would drive merchants out of the temple. That kind of Jesus we can't follow. And so he becomes a stumbling stone. That's exactly what happened to the chief priest and his family. Jesus is all right till he starts cutting into our money. Cutting into our profit. Start messing with our deal. No, we're going to reject him. He's going to have to go because he's costing us money. He's interfering with our ability to make money off the temple. He's got to go. Listen, if you don't accept Christ as the cornerstone of your life, he will become the stumbling stone that will ruin your life. Jesus is standing in Pilate's hall, friendless, forsaken, betrayed by all. Hearken what meaneth this sudden call. What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? Neutral, you cannot be. For one day your heart will be asking, what will he do with me? That old hymn, and the words of that hymn, remind us of this great truth. You cannot be neutral about Jesus Christ. You're either with him or you're against him. Why has he become the stumbling stone? Well, he says it because they will not. Verse uh, 8, they stumble because they disobey the message. They disobey the gospel message. Listen, their rejection of Jesus Christ is not because they don't think God could cause a virgin to be born to give birth to a son. They don't reject because they don't think Jesus could turn water into wine. After all, that can't happen. That would be like a miracle. That's not the reason. They don't reject Jesus Christ because they don't think God could create the universe and everything in it just by speaking it into existence. That's not the real reason why people reject Jesus Christ and him as the source of their life. They reject because they will not submit to anybody being in charge of their life but them. They disobey. In their disobedience, they reject the truth of the gospel. They are disobeying Therefore, they are disbelieving. Their disbelief does not lead to their disobedience. Understand, it's that order. When you were born in this world, you were born disobedient to God. You were born with a sin nature, a desire that I am going to be the center of the universe. And for at least one whole year, we all cater to your whims. And we're tired of it, by the way. 
because you're not the center of the world. But that disobedience has led people to reject Jesus Christ. Now he also says, this is exactly what they were destined for. They stumbled because they disobeyed the message, which is also what they were destined for. Thomas Schreiner says it this way in his commentary. He says, God has not only appointed those who disobey the word, that those who disobey the word would stumble and fall. He also has determined that they would disbelieve and stumble. And he says the idea that calamity also comes from God is often taught in the Old Testament. And he cites some examples because I can tell we don't believe that. That God would be the God of calamity. And uh, we're wrong. Listen to what the word of God says. Lamentation 3.38. Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both calamities and good things come? If God's in control, he's in control of both. God is not a helpless actor upon the whims of what people are doing and what is going on in the world. God is the one that intervenes to cause things to happen. The word of God doesn't just work out. Its wisdom doesn't just work out in life. God takes a hand to make it work out. Amos 3 says this, When a trumpet sounds in a city, do not the people tremble? When disaster comes to a city, what's the rest of it? Has not the Lord caused it? Bothered me a little bit after Katrina. Some theologians were saying, well, you know, God didn't cause that. And I was reading in Jeremiah while we were evacuated and said, who else could bring the wind? Listen, it's God that brings blessing. It's God that brings calamity. Isaiah 45, 7, God himself says, tells us, said, Isaiah, write this down. He said, I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. Not only is Jesus Christ the cornerstone, but God his Father is the one that's doing everything around us. He is controlling everything that's going on, and he makes it accomplish exactly what he plans for it to. Let me give you the greatest example of all. Peter, our writer, preaching in Acts chapter 2 says this, This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. God said, I'm willing to come and live under the rules I passed. He would never have gotten in Congress. But, uh, <laughs> all right, now that you're awake, now listen, it's real careful. Real careful here. God says, I'm willing to come and live under the rules I've set forth. And he said, I'm, my son, Jesus Christ, is going to come to this earth. And there is an appointed day for him to die. But you know why he's going to die? Because people with their wicked hands, people out of the desires, the evil desires of their own heart, they're going to deliver him up to be crucified. Do you know why that happened? Because it was part of God's plan. Now, both are true. God is in charge. But people still do the wickedness that comes out of their own heart. And God just takes that into account and works it out. They can never outthink God. But now listen, here's the great part. God took the worst, most wicked thing that people have ever done. They took the only innocent man that ever lived. The only righteous person that ever lived. The only person of whom we could say this person is love personified. There is no greater love than this man. He is perfect. And they crucified him. Can you think of a more wicked more heinous act. And yet God in the greatest of man's wickedness, in the very depths of man's wickedness, God said by that one act, I'll bring many to myself. By that one wicked act, I'll provide salvation and payment for the sins of the whole world. And that's exactly what happened. That's a great God that we serve. You can't outthink him. You can't outmaneuver him. You can say, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to be, and I'll just thwart God's plan. And that's exactly what Annas and Caiaphas were trying to do. 
And God said, no, you're going to fulfill my plan. Now listen, you can either let God build your life around Jesus Christ as the cornerstone, or you can stumble over him, but you will do God's will. You will accomplish God's plan and purpose. God says, I want you with me. Put your trust in Jesus Christ. Build your life on Jesus Christ, and your life will be blessed. Let's get ready to ascribe praise to God. Why should we praise God? Well, child of God, he says, you are a chosen, verse 9, you are a chosen people. God chose you. He didn't just choose us. He didn't just choose the nation of Israel. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you can be assured God chose me before the foundation of the world. My coming to faith is a part of God's eternal plan. God picked you out for a very special purpose that he has in mind for you. Not only are you chosen, but he's made you a royal priesthood. You are priest of the living God. God has not only chosen you, but he's chosen you for the highest purpose in all of creation. To represent him and to sing his praises. Not only are you a chosen people, a royal uh, priesthood, but you are the holy nation. Not just in the term, well, we don't have physical borders, but when he's talking about nation, then he's talking about a race of people. You are a chosen nation. Well, that's comforting. Because these folks had lost their nation. The moment they accepted Christ and started living for him, their home country no longer was their home country. They had to recognize that this world is not my home. My home is in heaven. My home is a heavenly country. It's a home where God rules and reigns. God says, I've made you a holy nation. You are dedicated not only for my purposes, but as a holy nation, you are dedicated for my blessing. I have decided to bestow all of my blessings on you individually and as a group. Not only are we a royal priest of the holy nation, but you're God's special possession. Do you realize that you never go anywhere without God having his eye on you? I know some of you are overprotected parents. You don't know who you are. You just think you're normal. But you know, there's never a time that God doesn't have his eye upon you. God's not watching and protecting. He's guiding, he's working everything. There was never a moment that Jesus Christ was out of God's eyesight. And I'm talking about not just God seeing him, but God saying this is exactly what needs to happen to my son. Even at the point where he had to almost literally turn his back, where Jesus is hanging on the cross wondering, God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When Jesus felt like he was lost, God still had his eye on him. And God still, in looking at Jesus, was pleased with his sacrifice. God always has his eye on you. You have never and will never leave his protective glance. He is working all things, good and bad, for your good to accomplish good purposes. I've had to really remind myself of that in the last two months. Uh, I'm looking to be healthy one of these days. Had teeth problems, had eye problems, had mental problems, <laughs> you know. And I'm thinking, okay, you know. Sort of like the Presbyterian that fell down the stairs. And he said, man, I'm glad that's over with. <laughs> Don't have a look for that to happen in the future. Man, I'm glad that's, I'm glad that's done. I'm glad I'm through that part. Man, boy, glad that part's over. But I still know, still remind myself I'm God's special possession. I also remind myself that I'm in a mortal body. What else can a mortal body do but fail? Duh. But I'm an immortal soul chosen by God, his special possession. He always has his eye on me. He's always got his eye on you. We can praise him for that. Light. You hate darkness, but we love light. Look in the city, we see a lot of darkness. You know why we see a lot of darkness in the city? Because there's dark-hearted people in the city. 
There's dark-hearted people in Luling. We used to be darkened people. But God said, let me call you out of that darkness into the light. And all of a sudden, the light dawned. I don't know how they used to say it in the olden days. I said, you know, like somebody lit a candle in the room. But I said, when I came to understand what salvation was, that it wasn't me doing, but that God, if I would just put my trust in Jesus Christ, God would save me. When that dawned on me, I said, like a light went on. Like somebody flipped a switch. It does. One guy said, duh. How could I have missed so simple a message? But I missed it for many, many years. Even after I'd gone forward, even after I'd been baptized, I was missing it. I knew I was missing it, but didn't know what it was I was missing. Well, I was missing you just put your faith in Christ. You trust him alone. And when that happened, the light flooded in. And God made it clear. And all of a sudden, things started making sense. I start to see. You know why I could see? Somebody turned the light on. It's hard to see in the dark. You start to see in the light because God gives us light. And we can praise him for that. God has made us his people. Once you were not a people, he says, verse 10, but now you are the people of God. Man, that's great. I'm proud to be an American citizen bothers me sometimes, but I'm proud to be an American citizen. But it's nothing compared to being God's citizen. Proud to be a people of God. Just thrilled to death. What an honor, what a privilege it is to be made a citizen of heaven, to be a part, a people of God. Man, that's better than anything I've ever received in my life. What a great privilege to be a part of the people of God. And the only reason you're a part of God's people and the only reason that I'm a part of God's people is because God chose to be merciful to us. You are chosen. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You have become God's special possession. God has called you out of darkness into the light. He's made you his people. And he has showed you tremendous mercy. We as the church, as the people of God, need to praise God for his mercies. Others may reject but their rejection changes nothing. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, and we praise him for that. We're here to serve the living God, the God of love. Let the church praise God. Let the church honor God. Let the church lift up God, even today.